Good morning, everyone. So pleased that you're all here. We're going to get started now. We're a couple minutes after, but that's great. I think people are still coming in. Um, we, uh, <laughs> I apologize. Hold on one second. You get to hear everything I say twice. <laughs> All right, let me try that again. Good morning, let's make sure there's no echo. <laughs> Good morning, <laughs> thank you. All right, great. So welcome to all of our participants who are here in the Smathers Library with us. And also thank you to our visitors who are watching online. Um, I'm gonna just introduce myself quickly, say a few words, and I'm gonna ask our Dean of uh, Libraries, Judy Russell, to come up and officially welcome everybody and, and get us off uh, to a good start. Um, really quick, a couple of orientation things for those of you who are here. Um, the two questions we get the most are where are the bathrooms and where's the coffee? So uh, bathrooms, if you have not been here before, if you go uh, through the long hallway, which is our Panama Canal Gallery, all the way to the end of the building, there are bathrooms down there. And the men's bathroom is a little hidden behind some uh, doors. You have to go around an extra pair of doors to get to them. Coffee, we do have some complimentary coffee over here this morning. Um, there's a Starbucks that's as convenient as it can get, which is just in the very next building, Library West, right at the entrance. There's also other coffee options across the street. Um, I'm going to ask help people to raise their hands just so you know who we all are. By the way, my name is John Nimmers, and I am the curator of the Panama Canal Museum Collection. I'm going to ask Betsy Bemis to raise her hand. Betsy is our associate curator. I'm gonna ask Melissa Jerome to raise her hand. Melissa is gonna be helping us with chat today uh, for our online participants. And I don't see Pam Cunningham Williams in the room. She's probably still in the lobby as is Chandler, uh, Sandy, they're in the lobby, but I'll make sure they raise their hand later so you know who they are. If you need anything at all, ask one of us and we'll be happy to get you oriented where you need to go. Um, okay, uh, we are broadcasting online at this, uh, simultaneously. Uh, we're going to be taking uh, questions from the audience. Melissa is going to be monitoring that for us. So for those of you who are online, if you have questions, if you're not hearing us, anything like that, just uh, send a chat to uh, the hosts and Melissa will be able to respond to you. I think that's my homework that I need to get out of the way before we get started officially. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our Dean of Libraries. And I should say up front that I, I always say this, but it's true. Um, if there's, it really takes an army to manage the Panama Canal Museum collection here at the University of Florida. But if there's any one person who is most responsible for the success of the collection over the last 10 years, it's Dean Russell. Uh, she was very instrumental in bringing the collection. <laughs> thank you, thank you. She was very instrumental in bringing the collection to UF uh, in the first place in 2012. And uh, she has continued to help shepherd and guide us in everything that we're doing. So I'm very pleased that uh, Dean Russell's here today to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I would have to say that I think the person who is most responsible for the success of the collection is right here, John Nimmers. <laughs> it has definitely been a labor of love for all of us. And we're so proud to have it here. And we're particularly proud and pleased that we have this close collaboration with the Pan-Caribbean Sankofa. Um, we're very eager to build an even larger collection of oral histories and the fact that you all could help us do that and then that we can um, host them here uh, so that they're available worldwide with, uh, to people who have an interest in these issues uh, through our Digital Library of the Caribbean in our Panama and our Canal Digital Collections. And we also have collaborated on collecting archival material to add to the collections. 
And it's been very important to us that it represent not just the Americans who may have lived and worked, been born and raised even in the canal zone, but that it, that it do, represents so many of the uh, people from the Caribbean who participated from the very beginning in the building of the canal and then the operation of it. So we're very grateful that we have this opportunity to work more closely with you and to really explore both what we have accomplished and what remains that we can be doing together. So I'm delighted to welcome you. We're excited about the possibility of uh, more exhibits. You'll see if you have not already the exhibit uh, that's currently in the Namad Gallery, if for no other reason, and you'll pass through it on your way to the restrooms as John pointed out. Um, but there are lots of plans for future exhibits and your contributions to that will be very important to us. So we're very grateful that you're here. I'll be coming in and out over the course of the next two days as my schedule permits, but I know you're in very good hands with John and uh, others here. And so I hope you enjoy the conference and I look forward to hearing very good things about the next steps we've identified to continue and expand this partnership. So welcome all of you and thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, you should all have on your uh, table, but if you don't, we have extras. Uh, we have programs that talk us, uh, will lead you through the activities for today and tomorrow. Uh, there's also a calendar that's a little take home, take away gift if you'd like to uh, bring that home with you. We've got extras of those, by the way. Um, and we'll be putting both of these online for those of you who are online and that way, you, if you'd like, you can print your own calendars. Um, so uh, I would also, I, I do not think Carlos is in the room, but um, I would also like to thank, uh, there's, there's probably a Carlos, but I was looking for a specific Carlos. <laughs> Good morning, Carlos. Uh, there, um, I would also like to thank our other sponsor, which uh, the Center for Latin American Studies here at the University of Florida. We work very closely with the center and a lot of uh, variety of programs. We work closely with their students. Uh, exhibits, conferences, um, and the center has graciously co-sponsored this event with us. Um, and uh, Professor Carlos uh, De La Torre he wasn't able to be here this morning. He thought he might be able to stop by briefly just to welcome you. Uh, but we work closely with the faculty and students of the center and, and you'll see some of them and some of them will actually be talking to you this morning. Um, speaking of great partners, um, there are so many people in this room who have participated in, uh, in interviews and in past activities like our webinar that we did last year um, in uh, promoting all that Pan-Caribbean, Sankofa and the University of Florida are partnering to do. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, I, uh, this is a little corny, but I just wanna get a show of hands. How many people have participated uh, in any kind of interview process relating to Caribbeans and, and, uh, and Panama Canal history. If you've, if you've done an interview yourself, if you've interviewed other people, if you have helped arrange or promote interviews. Yeah, so there's several people here who have done this, great. Um, so we, and I'm sure there's plenty more who are online as well, uh, who weren't able to travel here. It really demonstrates the commitment that uh, we have with documenting the history of the, the canal, of the canal zone, the former canal zone and of Panama. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the other important uh, aspects of what we do, by the way, is promotion. And um, we rely heavily on word of mouth, but we also rely on individuals such as Carmela Gobern, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, but Carmela with Cyber News, she's very diligent about spreading the word. And I know many of you in the audience, Sheila, I know you've done this for in the past, you spread words amongst yourselves. And so one of the things I would say is thank you to everybody who, if you haven't even participated in any of our activities in any other way, if you're just telling people about the, what we're doing, it's a win for us. Um, so of course, everything that we're doing, uh, it's all possible because of our partnership with Pan Caribbean and Sankofa. Um, I can tell you briefly that uh, when I first met Fran uh, in 2019, um, Fran came up to me at a Panama Canal Society reunion and she said, so what do you do to document uh, Caribbeans and the history of the canal? And she asked some excellent questions. They were so good, as a matter of fact, that we said, we need to meet to discuss this more because this is something that we, we need to be doing at the University of Florida. And it was something certainly that 
uh, Fran and her uh, CGM Foundation, um, were, uh, this, the Corzal, Mount Hope, and uh, Gatun uh, Cemetery Foundation, that they were very interested in documenting the, um, the histories of the Caribbean. The Caribbean. Um, and so from that first initial meeting, I think that was in July of 2019, it's been a whirlwind since then. And I think uh, it, I, in some ways, I think we've just kind of buckled in and said, you know, Fran has been driving and it's felt a little bit like a cra crazy Mr. Toad's wild ride or something at a time because we've done a lot in three years. You know, there's dozens of interviews have been conducted by Can Pan Caribbean San Cofa. We've uh, produced videos, we've put them online on YouTube. We have uh, a webinar I mentioned earlier. And of course, having this event here to this two day event that we're having today. Uh, it's just been a phenomenal amount of activity in a, a very short period of time, actually. So it's, it's been wonderful. Um, I've talked about her enough and I've been looking at her enough. I'll just invite Fran now up to say a few words. Uh, Fran, uh, if you will please come up and take the mic. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, wow. Good morning again to all. On behalf of Pan Caribbean Sankofa, I'd like to extend a warm welcome, as the others have said, to everyone here today and those of you who have joined us virtually. It is truly wonderful for me to see so many familiar faces and new faces in the audience here today. And I'm especially pleased to acknowledge that many of you here in person and virtually are first generation US born descendants of Panamanian West Indian uh, or Caribbean ancestry. I thank you for being here and I'm so proud that you have taken the interest uh, in getting here to Gainville, which is no easy shot to get here, um, uh, for your interest in your Panamanian West Indian ancestry and culture. It is your generation that we will be relying on to keep our history alive for future generations to know. Sankofa, uh, the word Sankofa in the name of our organization is an African word from the Akan tribe in Ghana that literally translate the translation of the word and the symbol, the bird looking back is, and I quote, it is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. Uh, that is profound for me. It is profound for the group that came up with the word because it is so significant of what this organization, this project is all about. Um, in speaking truth to power, Marcus Garvey, another uh, amazing um, uh, um, person in our history, beautifully said, and I quote, a people without the knowledge of their past history and culture is like a tree without its roots. With that said, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Dean Russell, who has, you just met, Professor Leah Rosenberg, curator John Nemers, and Betsy Nemers, and Betsy Bennis. I think she's a Nemer sometimes. <laughs> um, who welcomed us to this university three years ago, this September, for a table discussion, as John said, concerning what we felt was a seemingly obvious exclusion of our story and history involved in the Panama Canal. Just to give you a brief summary of how this all started, I met Betsy and John at the annual reunion, as he mentioned, in Orlando, held by the Americans who lived on the former Canal Zone. John and Betsy were there. John and Betsy were there as representatives of the George Mathers Library here at the university, uh, and which I would later discover 
I didn't know at the time, that the library acquired the Panama Canal Museum collection from a group of Americans who had been building their history over the years. Um, I attended the reunion. As a matter of fact, I was the only first, one black face in the group, um, promoting awareness about the neglect and, ab and abandonment of the silver cemeteries at Curzal, Gatun, and Monthope. So none of this is a coincidence. It, it, there is a connection here. Um, where our ancestors and families are buried. CGM, as we call it, we refer to the as we refer to the organization, was founded in 2016 by the descendants of the silver workers and build builders and workers of the Panama Canal, and whose rested place was in a deplorable condition. Um, and so, our goal with this organization was to raise awareness and bring a consciousness to the world of the conditions that our ancestors were left in. Breaks my heart every time I think about it. Um, I must say that the, American, the cemeteries were well maintained prior to the turnover of the canal. Uh, the Americans, even though we were separated in many of these cemeteries, the Panama Canal Company did maintain the cemeteries. Um, not knowing anyone at the, at the event, I spent my time perusing the halls and I came across a room filled with photos, memorabilia, photos of the Panama Canal, photos depicting American life on the canal zone. Um, uh, and I, I looked and I said, well, is this the same canal zone that I grew up on? <laughs> um, uh, something felt odd and it just didn't seem right. I saw nothing depicting my life, the life that I grew up with. My story, where was my communities? schools, churches, nothing about my ancestors who labored and sacrificed and contributed so much during and after the building of this magnificent wonder of the world. Thousands paying ult the ultimate price in debt. It just seemed one, a one-sided story to me. Which is what I said to Betsy, when I met her. Poor Betsy, I could see her eyes now. <laughs> and John wasn't there. And she begged me to come back to speak with John the next day. And Jen, John begged me to come back to meet Dean Russell. So meeting Betsy and John that day led to an invitation, as John said earlier, to the university for a table discussion regarding my observation at the time. I soon reached out to our folks to share my experience and to ask for support. Got to realize that I am like the third generation way, way down. So I needed the troops. I called on Ricardo Millet in Chicago, Fred Smith, Carla Celine, Arcelio R. Hartley in Panama, Luis Emanuel in New York, and they all agreed to join me. And, um, and a number of others participated via Zoom. Our concern over the exclusion, marginalization, and possible erasure of our people in history did not fall on deaf ears. Not only did the UF listen, they wholeheartedly agreed with our observation. And the conversation soon shifted in that meeting to a brainstorming session of what we can do, where we can start to make this right. Um, um, the idea of all the histories came up. 
And we didn't have a penny. We didn't know how to start. John said, don't worry about that. We'll figure something out. <clears throat> Not in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that I would be standing here today. It's so I just thank you. A partnership with the UF and Sankofa was formed. We received funds from the university to help begin the process of interviewing everyday folks from our community, people from our communities about their family history and their experiences. COVID happened and we thought it was over. But thanks to Zoom, it continued. I met some amazing people, heard amazing stories via Zoom. The richness of our heritage came across in every interview we have done to date. I am honored to introduce to you today one of those interviewees, Miss Nydia Thomas. Nydia and I first connected in her efforts to find her great grandfather's Teddy's grave at the Corazal Cemetery. We found Teddy, all right, and I'll leave that to Nydia to tell that story. And then another time during our interview, their interview process, Nydia was proudly showing me as a first generation, her interest in her history and all this research that she had done. Nydia was perusing and showing photos and it seems like her grandfather was into a musical playwright and whatever, an orchestra. And she flashed on a, uh, an orchestra and I said, back, back, <laughs> back, back. <laughs> and she did. I said, that's my grandfather. My grandfather died in 1951. I won't tell my age, but he died before I was born. And um, so I didn't know him, but I knew that he was a musician. My mom always spoke of him playing the bass. My mom had photos of him and his bass. And accidentally, we don't want to blame any one of her nine children, how it happened, but it got discarded when she moved to the United States. So for me, seeing my grandfather through Nydia's treasures, it was the most amazing and rewarding experience in this whole process. There's many, but in that process, so I, I called my siblings and I'm like, well, let's verify, is this him? And they, yes, look at the ears, look at this, you know. So with, without further ado, I just want to share a little bit about this wonderful lady, Nydia, first generation US born, Nydia D. Thomas, JD is a native Texas whose family's presence in the Republic of Panama dates to, dates to the early days of the construction of the Panama Canal. Her love of family, history stems from a genuine fascination with her parents' nostalgic stories and photographic images of life on the isthmus in the early 20th century. She's a graduate of Howard University School of Law and celebrates her 38th year shaping laws that impact justice involved you. She was, she was a contributing author and editor in chief of Texas Juvenile Law, a legal treatise and used extensively by Texas juvenile justice practitioners, courts, and law schools. Nydia represents one of the many, many descendants of ancestors who sacrificed and paved the way, and we owe this honor to them. Without further ado, we begin by introducing Nydia. Thank you.
ask this one. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I am a West Indian Panamanian from East Texas. <laughs> Let me say that again with an accent. I am a West Indian Panamanian from East Texas, y'all. <laughs> I'm really so glad to be here with you today. That humorous self-identification really is the journey of a people, the complex, vibrant, and triumphant journey of the Panamanian people. It is also the journey of my family. We're here today to celebrate my grandfather, Milton Garvey. Milton Garvey is known as a dramatist. Thank you. As a dramatist, a theater producer, director. Some called him the Panamanian part, part of the Panamanian Isthmian literati. My family members called him Pa. So we're so glad to be here with you today. As we talk a little bit today, I'd like to start by saying buenos dias, I mean, familia Garvey in Panama, who may be joining us virtually. I'd like to say hello to my brother Bill, who could not be here with us today. I'd like to say hello to my cousin, Deborah English Mendoza, who can be here with us today. But I am glad that my cousin, Connie Eloisa Garvey Brown, as well as my tia, Diana Macias, uh, actually Diana Garvey Macias, is, and her husband, Prospero, are here with us today. All right, great. As I said, growing up in East Texas, it's part of the Southern tradition for people to ask, so who are your people? But as a child of two Panamanian immigrants, my late parents, William Thomas and Mita Garvey Thomas, were well known in their community. But for me, that was sort of an existential question. And so that led me in a quest for discovery. Who are my ancestors? And what about my life is part of their enduring legacy? And so we dedicate our program today and the next two days to their irrepressible uh, spirit forged uh, through the labor and struggle, the path that we now follow. As we said, the images of Panama always captivated me. My parents always referred to Panama as home. The families of my aunts and uncles and cousins, the races in Balboa and La Boca. And of course, this special picture of my mom and dad in the 1940s walking along the ruins of old Panama. It's where I'd like to think of them together now, walking the ruins of old Panama. I love genealogy. I love to be the history detective, looking at the family photographs, searching for clues, collecting oral histories, becoming a part of social media groups and e-learning, trying to learn more about our heritage as part of the work that I was doing. I've been able to build a tree of almost two or 300 people who are part of our family. 
But one of the things that you realize as we begin to study the migration and resistance of our people is that there are some brick walls in those archives trying to find, first of all, information about West Indian women. They are literally invisible and undocumented in the records. Finding information in the parochial records in Barbados and Jamaica and others, men, the fathers, who are not in the record because of the church's idea about unmarried parents, absent and gone from our record. And so it forces us to use alternative methods, oral history, photographs, making sure that we reach out and find the information from our elders to collect and preserve the stories of the resilience in our family. Again, we see the politics of the archives. The amazing thing is that groups like Ancestry and Family Search now have begun to expand their offerings of Caribbean records throughout the diaspora. And so if you are interested in finding information like the Panama Canal Zone employee metal check records or the baptism records of your family, begin to use those tools to explore your family. The other piece of that that is also important is that in Panama in particular, we have to advocate for the ease of access to digitized records involving Panamanians because that information is not available. You almost have to go to the clerk's office and the civil registry in order to get that information. And so part of this work is to expand the availability of that information for all to see and to be able to reconstruct their efforts. Now, Fran talked a little bit about the work of CGM. And again, I found information about my great grandfather, my maternal great grandfather, who we called Teddy. And in November of 2021, we were able to find his grave. My cousin Eddie was part of CGM, Eddie Clark. And I, I was looking through the Gorgas mortuary records after discussing information with my mother. Tell me about your great grandfather. What do you know? And all of that. And she said, well, I remember he died in September when I was 15 years old. So that gave me a year. 1939, to begin to search those records. And I looked in the Gorgas Mortuary records and there Teddy was. And so Shakespeare says, let's talk of graves and epitaphs, make dust our paper and write on the bosom of the earth. And so today we are making dust our paper and we are writing on the bosom of the earth through organizations like CGM and the Pan-Caribbean Sankofa and the wonderful work that the folks here at the University of Florida are doing. But as you begin to discuss these kind of questions, the important thing is that you realize the significant disparities. My father's family grew up in La Boca in the, in the canal zone side. My mother's family grew up in the Rio Bajo on the Panama City side. And so out of that experience, you begin to see the divided destiny of both of those in their final resting place. And so if, if there is a political statement in that respect, you see the divided destiny by the places where Teddy was found in November of 2021 in an almost anonymous grave, number 1817, under pounds of dirt, and, and the rainforest reclaiming that cemetery at Corozal. On the Corozal American side, you see pictures of the home going service of my grandmother, uh, 
Clara Leslie Thomas, and my grandfather who became a, an American citizen through his uh, ascription through the Navy in World War I and World War II and later worked on the Canal Zone. And of course, his service in 1971, the manicured pristine existence of two of my ancestors and my aunt, Bernice, who is also buried there beginning in 2016. So again, we see that disparity in the final resting place. As Fran mentioned as well, we were talking, we continued to talk because Fran knew most of my family. <laughs> Many of the family members that I didn't know growing up alone in East Texas. But of course, she said, back, back up, back up. As I was telling her about my grandfather, Milton Garvey, and the Culebra Colored Association, and the Panama Melodra Melodramatic Association, and the wonderful pictures that my cousin, Debbie Mendoza, and my aunt, Winnie, saved for us. And the, and the man in the circle is Oscar M. Haywood, Fran's grandfather, a bassist in the Garfield Murray Symphony Orchestra. So then we jumped on a Zoom call with the folks from the University of Florida. How can we explore this? How can we do something different? How can we interview you and what can we do? And of course, enter Dr. Leah Rosenberg, who by December and by January had developed a syllabus digitizing the archives and identified a way that we could collaborate and how her students could learn how to collaborate with members of the public to contextualize the history of Milton Garvey and his work as a dramatist. So thus we have digitizing the archives, migration and resistance. And of course, it's a collaborative effort between the Department of English, the Humanities Project with Dr. Leo Rosenberg, the Corozal Mount Hope Gatun Cemetery, Pan-Caribbean Sankofa, and the University of, Li of, uh, uh, of Florida Library. Again, a collaboration. Milton Garvey, as, as we continue to research his history, we know that he began his first job in 1918, the Canal Zone, Tivoli Hotel as a steward. We find him on the 1920 census record. He was able to parlay that meager service role to become a chauffeur for Dr. Raul Moreno, the ambassador to Spain, and then as finally as valet to Dr. Armorio Arias, president of Panama. And all the while he had this theatrical love, a creative love. And so what I call this is creative intelligence as a form of resistance. And it's a theme that goes through our entire family. And we, can, we continue to have people involved in the creative arts. He sets in his memoirs, the scrapbook that contained all the pictures and the cast photos and also other uh, notes, scribblings about each of the actors who were involved. But I think this is very, very telling because he sets an evocative stage about life on the isthmus. He says, looking back to the days of construction when malaria played havoc with the builders of the Panama Canal, when there were hardly streets and very much less places of amusement. This group and Milton's dream was to bring joy and life and dignity to the people of Panama and especially the folks in the West Indian community. I put a picture of my cousin Debbie because again, I wish she was able to join us today. But these faces that you see, the actors and actresses, 
Fred Brathwaite and VP Leacock and Etta Edwards and Lydia Glasgow and the cast, uh, the Cave Hill dancers from Barbados and, and of course the cast photos as well are part of that significant legacy. Their faces haunted me. They said, tell our story. They are more than a footnote in history. They are part of Panamanian history and their descendants are throughout the world. And so I'm so proud today to introduce to you the students through their research and scholarship who will share with you the arc of our grandfather's life, Milton Garvey. Thank you for your scholarship, your enthusiasm, the energy, and of course, Dr. Leah Rosenberg for having the vision to do this work, but Brooke and Chandler and Danalo, Jacob, Noah, Sasa, Scientica, I'm excited to hear what you will share. Thank you so much for your hard work. Come on up. Um, I'll try to find out the version. Okay. Okay. Give me one second and we're going to go ahead and pull this up. I'm going to stop sharing just so. about that. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, it's John's email, so I can't look in his email. You guys are ready. You can enter. So, um, I'm Leah, and I'm just going to introduce my class very briefly, and then they will take over. So, this is, I don't. I think we have a, um, it's always hard to tell about the microphone. This is Brooke Whitaker, who is an, an, an expert in geography and therefore has been a great help with the map part of this. This is Sasha Wells, who's an MA student in the history department and a specialist in transatlantic and Caribbean history. Danalo Chakma, who is a PhD student in English. Shantika Chakraborty, who is also a PhD student in English, and um, Chandler Mordecai, who is also in English, as is Brooke. So I 
So I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. So without further ado, I think, Brooke, you're going to start off by introducing the project. Hi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. And thank you for everyone who's given introductions, especially Nydia and Fran for introducing us and for putting this whole thing together. Um, so I am going to introduce to you our story map project. So what is a story map? It's the software that combines audio, visual, geographical, um, temporal, all these sorts of elements to create an interactive project. So this is an actual physical link that is included. Um, I believe it will be shared with you. It's in the Zoom meeting as well that you can interact with yourself. And so before we get into the heart of the project, I just wanna introduce you how to interact with this software. So our project is titled Milton Garvey, a case study of West Indian culture and labor. So we have several headers here. You'll see throughout the presentation that you can click through them and it will take you to different sections. Um, I'll start by explaining the map elements of this project. So throughout our story map, we have several maps detailing the pertinent locations to Milton Garvey's life and the general locations in um, the Caribbean Sea and Panama and all that. And so we have several photographs as well. If you wanna interact with an element in the presentation, you can click something like this. It'll take you to the image. You can also scroll, scroll through images as in like a slideshow. Something like this, click it, bring it up for better clarity. Um, we have different sound elements as well, as we'll see throughout the presentation, things that you would click here. And I do wanna emphasize that this is not a static project. This is something that's continually evolving and changing. This is a collective story and it's your story. And so while watching this presentation, if you see something where you're like, oh, I have pictures of this, or I, I know this location, I, I recognize this event, um, please feel free to share that with us because we wanna capture your story as best as we can. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Chandler and she's gonna take over the introduction section. Thank you, Brooke. Yes, we wanted to emphasize, as Brooke was saying, this is an ongoing living project. So if you have any information or any photos, we do encourage you to come to us or submit those to us, and we would be happy to dive further into those details. So as it has been discussed, this is entitled Milton Garvey, A Case Study of West Indian Culture and Labor. I will start with giving a brief overview of the introduction. Our introduction has a little bit more details that you might find pertinent, but I will just give a very brief overview because we'll be discussing much of this throughout the overall exhibit. Um, essentially, this exhibit tells the largely unknown story and life and accomplishments of Milton Duncan Garvey. Garvey immigrated as a young man from Barbados to Panama during the canal construction and began working as a steward in the Tivoli Hotel and was a star cricket player. He later became an influential playwright in Panama and gained national recognition. His granddaughter, Nydia Thomas, has brought his story to light as part of her research into her family history. As Brooke was saying, we have several images throughout this exhibit. And as you can see here, this is a photo of Milton Garvey. This exhibit is part of a collaborative oral history project undertaken by Pan-Caribbean Sankofa, also this graduate seminar digitizing the archive of migration and resistance in the English department at the University of Florida and the University of Florida libraries to increase materials, resources, and visibility in documenting the voices and experiences of West Indians and the Panama Museum collection. We have a little bit of information about Nydia, which we again cannot express enough gratitude to her contributions throughout this project. This project would not be possible without Nydia and her family. We have uh, again a bio here that you can read. Nydia Thomas's family history offers a window into West Indian experiences and the global history they participated in, including West Indian migration to Panama, the construction of the Panama Canal Zone, Panamanian literary and entertainment scenes, as well as World War I and World War II. And there are several resources that Ms. Thomas used that we've documented here that have also helped make this exhibit possible. We also wanted to highlight um, Ms. Deborah English Mendoza, who helped preserve the Garvey family legacy by keeping the family scrapbook and sharing its contents, including photos, Milton Garvey's playbills, and newspaper clippings. We've included Ms. Mendoza's English, I mean, Ms. Mendoza's picture here, as well as a brief biography. 
We also wanted to include actual images of the scrapbook. So this is these are actual images from the Garvey family scrapbook. You can click on them and interact with them. So we see we have several reviews here, one being of Ramblin' Rose, which we will discuss in greater detail. These, play, these scrapbook images also include pictures and really emphasize the importance of African diaspora scrapbooks as vital historical records. And the emphasis that we wanted to make is that a lot of these images and a lot of these reviews are many people don't have access to until they were published and digitized by the uh, Digital Library of the Caribbean in the Workman, which is a uh, West Indian newspaper that we will be discussing further in 2013. So these images and these scrapbooks are really vital and they're really invaluable when discussing West Indian history. While this project focuses on the life of um, Nydia Thomas's maternal grandfather, Milton Garvey, we wanted to emphasize that this is a, that Ms. Ms. Thomas has an, a large history of individuals in her family who have also contributed to Panamanian experience, that we can also gain windows into that experience as well. And these are some images and well as um, some audio bites that we've included. So getting into more of a, a brief overview of Milton Garvey, Milton Garvey led a rich life that serves as a window into larger questions concerning the experiences of West Indians in Panama. For example, his relocation from Barbados to Panama illustrate a larger migration to Panama from across the Caribbean. His work as a playwright also contributed to the growing Black international identity that fostered through works of literature, art, music, and the press. Black internationalism and cultural production in the early 20th century are usually thought of having their home in Harlem, also known as the Harlem Renaissance. West Indian immigrants and their descendants in Panama produced many prominent works of drama, music, and dance, contributing to what scholar Laura Putnam calls the Panama Renaissance. It's our intention to highlight a part of this Panama Renaissance through the works of Milton Garvey and a host of actors, actresses, and musicians. So an overview of our exhibit, the first section tracks his youth and migration from Barbados to Panama between the years 1894 and 1908. The second section moves into his time working at the Tivoli Hotel and his involvement from cricket from 1909 to 1923. And the third section moves directly into his time as a playwright between 1924 and 1935. Lastly, this exhibit will conclude with Garvey's legacy, both within Panama and within his home family. Below is a timeline of key dates and events in Garvey's life. It is based on Nydia Thomas's research and her family scrapbook. You can also explore this timeline. And as Brooke was saying, this exhibit also includes a large overview of the locations that are pertinent to Milton Garvey's life. All right, please join me in welcoming our next colleague as they will dive further into the life of Milton Garvey. Thank you. Uh, good day. So thanks to Nydia Thomas's previous research, we were able to garner details about Garvey's life, such as he was born in 1894 and baptized in the parish of St. Michael. Um, if you scroll down, you can see here is his actual baptismal record. This is him in the column. So we know that his mother Winifred worked as a laundress and we theorized that she probably worked in a similar occupation in Panama. Winifred and Milton migrated in 1908 when Milton was 14. And these are some of the only tangible facts that we know about Milton's early life. So um, in this section, we wanted to help viewers understand why laborers migrated to Panama. So we'll be exploring Garvey's childhood, the culture of migration that Garvey grew up in, the social change that migration brought about in Barbados and the experiences of migration to Panama from some primary sources. So here are some social and economic reasons for migration. So immigration, um, immigration stem from the crisis surrounding the largest crop in Barbados, which was sugar. And in the background here, um, if you wanna interact with it, you can click and it'll open up. This is actually a uh, sugar cane mill in Barbados. So newly invented beet sugar started to topple cane sugar, which was the type grown in Barbados and the loss of protective British sugar duties destroyed the market within Barbados. Um, so in the background here, you can actually see some goods being exported from uh, Bridgetown, Barbados. 
And the sugar crisis created extreme poverty in Barbados, and this allowed the U.S. to target Barbadians as workers for the Panama Canal and Panama Canal Zone. So by 1911, over one fourth of the island's population would migrate for work. Garvey and Winifred would have been a part of this wave of migration. In the background here, you can see some Barbadian sugar laborers. So since the island's economy was based on sugar, the sugar-based plantocracy started to lose economic and political control of Barbados. Migration allowed a social shift to take place and allowed and led to the betterment of those who stayed in Barbados. The Black Barbadians started to agitate for social change as the social power began to shift, and this is all thanks to migration. Historian Bonham Richardson says a decline in planter paternalism was accompanied by heightened class consciousness and inseparate political activity by Black Barbadians. In a broad sense, the Barbadian exodus to Panama was a creative grassroots catalyst of social change, not simply a pathetic drift of labor to capital. So here is a map of Bridgetown. For three years prior to his departure, Garvey would have gazed upon immigrants leaving Barbados from the main dock, Trafalgar Square, as he lived in Upper Bay Street, which was a few blocks from Trafalgar Square. And here is Upper Bay Street in the photo. So Milton Garvey was 11 when the U.S. set up its recruitment station in Bridgetown, and they signed a contract with the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company to help transport workers, such as you can see in this picture here, laborers departing from Bridgetown to go to Cologne. Migration would have grown steadily from 1905 to 1908, which was the year Garvey left, up until the point where around 3,000 people would have been in the square seeking a voyage to Panama. In uh, 1908, travel for women and children would have increased as families began to settle in Panama. So using primary sources, we were able to construct some idea of what travel would have been like. Here you can see some routes of the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company. Um, let me scroll down. We highlighted this area. Um, so here's a possible route that the RMSP would have taken. It would have gone from Barbados to Demera, which is modern day Guyana, and then up the South American coast to Panama. Um, however, because of yellow fever outbreak, which took place um, from 1907 to 1909, the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company did not stop in Barbados, so it is likely that Garvey and his mother took a schooner, which would have led them from Bridgetown to Trinidad, then up the South American coast to either Venezuela or Colombia, and finally to Cologne. So here we have some various travel accounts. So John Bowen's travel account, would have, which comes from the film Diggers, which I believe is being shown here, um, I think tomorrow, was around the time Garvey and his mother traveled, says that the, he says that the ship was crowded and that people slept wherever there was space. Many people died during the journey and self-provided provisions were shared among all the passengers. Eric Waldron, who also traveled as a young boy, gives a youthful insight into the journey by stating that there was constant discomfort, people of all races were packed tightly together and there was no room for personal space or respectability. Walren and Garvey migrated within three years of each other and both became prominent West Indian intellectuals in Panama. Here's actually a photo of some laborers arriving um, in Panama. So now from a more pri privileged perspective, we see Arthur Ball, Arthur Ballard, author of Panama, the Canal, the Country and the People, describing the passage that it was difficult as he observes those who were migrating. Milton Garvey's move would help aid in building the West Indian cultural community within Panama. And while the circumstances that aided the move were repugnant, Garvey and all those who migrated would have helped shift the social power to the Black Barbadian working class. As we will illustrate in later sections, Garvey was able to thrive in Panama and grow the intellectual scene there. I'll now be passing off to my colleague, Dinalo. Thank you, Sasha. Okay, so um, 
This section 1909 to 1923, the Tripoli Hotel and West Indian level, this is actually divided into two parts. I'm going to talk about Milton Garvey's role as a steward in the Tripoli Hotel, and my colleague Denalo will be focusing on Milton Garvey's role as a cricketer in Tripoli Boys. Um, so this section begins with um, the image of this medal check, and I would like to thank Smedia because she very generously shared this image with us. Um, so, as you can see, this is um, the medal check, and it actually talks about Milton Garvey's arrival year and the time he started to work in Tivoli as a steward. But uh, what I'm going to focus on in this section is something that I have termed as the politics of the archive, which is the privileging of the narratives of the people in power, which is the white men, at the expense of the people in the margins, people like Milton Garvey and his contemporaries in the West Indian um, section or West Indian society. Um, this section in the beginning talks a little bit about his uh, biographical details, some of which have already been taken into account by my colleagues. So he talks about his mother and um, his marriage and his six children, and then it gradually moves towards his role as a steward in the, uh, in the Tivoli Hotel. Um, this also has some images of Tivoli Hotel. So this is the Tivoli Hotel in Ankan, as you can see. Um, and obviously the Tivoli Hotel was a major symbol of the imperial status of the United States. But what was fascinating is that people like Milton Garvey who worked there and his contemporaries, they made Tivoli what Tivoli was. But what I say when I uh, talk about the politics of the archive is that, that these people were largely absent from the archive pertaining to Tivoli. So we get photographs of the hotel Tivoli and its magnificent decoration and its amazing dining room and also the uh, photographs of the people who were guests, people of importance, like US President Teddy Roosevelt and other guests of honor. But obviously, we don't have any photograph or image of Milton Garvey or his contemporaries in the Tivoli Hotel because they were deemed persons of trivial importance or insignificant. So that is what I call politics of the archive. Um, so as you can see, this is the um, one of the um, dining rooms of Tivoli Hotel. And you can see this is very neatly and delicately organized, but obviously it doesn't have presence of Milton Garvey's or any other steward in the hotel for obvious reasons. Um, there are two newspaper, um, images of two newspapers from the New York Times archive that talks about the arrival of US President Teddy Roosevelt and how he was staying at the Tivoli Hotel, but obviously it excludes any mention of anyone from the workforce associated with the Tivoli Hotel. And I do have this little sidecar, I believe, uh, the images showcasing the magnificence of the Tivoli Hotel. So this is the front view. This was one of the dance performances organized to honor Roosevelt's presence at the Tivoli Hotel, but obviously you will not find any West Indian workforce or laborers working in the Tivoli Hotel, a private room in the Tivoli Hotel. Um, as I've mentioned, despite its architectural grandeur and luxuries it offered its guests, the Tivoli Hotel relegated its silver workers to housing where they had no privacy or space. So this is one of the images of the housings that we have here. So as you can see, this is in stark contrast and in opposition to the grandeur and magnificence of the Tivoli Hotel. This is where the silver workers lived. And obviously, um, I have also tried to mention the labor intensive conditions of the Tivoli Hotel. So this is from one of the accounts of Milton Garvey's possible contemporaries, Lancelot A. Cavana, who was also an immigrant from Jamaica during the construction era, who worked as a waiter at the Tivoli Hotel. And this is what he had to say, that the tips, they were heavy at the Tivoli Hotel, but obviously he had to work around the clock. And that, that is when he, it was excruciating physical ordeal and labor that he had to go through. And obviously he had to leave within two months because his legs started to tremble. And that's how he would be exhausted after an entire day of work at the Tivoli Hotel. So obviously this highlights again what I have been 
time and again mentioning as the politics of the archive, which again operates on the principle of selective inclusion of materials in the archive, which often takes into account the voices of the privileged and the entitled, as I've again, time and again, have been saying that mainly the narratives of the white people. And uh, I have decided to end this section with these two images. So this is actually during the Panama Canal construction. And we can see Teddy Roosevelt present somewhere in there. And what I found interesting about these two images is that the people in the um, workforce, a few of them or some of them can only be photographed in the presence of a white man. So the people from, from the West Indian community they need to be represented in photographs or in the archive, but only if that is in the presence of a white man or a man of significant honor like Teddy Roosevelt. And that is why a few black men or few West Indian men working during the construction of the Panama Canal, they had the enough fortune to be clicked with a white man and be present in the archive. But obviously Milton Garvey wasn't that fortunate. So that is why he has been completely absent and excluded at least from this part of Tivoli section or from the archive. And that is how I'm ending my section and I'll be handing it over to Dinal. Thank you. Thank you, Shantika. So, So Shantika has uh, discussed on the West Indian uh, labor in Panama and uh, the politics of archive that silences their voices. My section transport to the ways that West Indians in Panama uh, mobilized themselves and found expression in culture and cricket. So starting with Milton Garvey and cricket. Uh, so this section highlights Milton Garvey's passion for cricket and how the workman, a West Indian, a diasporic West Indian newspaper in Panama, registers the voice and the presence of Garvey and his community through cricket. So um, here we can see uh, it says that, sorry. Okay, I will go this way. So this one is actually from snippet from the workman which says that Milton Garby was a player and very impressively, he was the captain of the Tivoli boys. So in this particular um, newspaper cutting, it says, it states that under the skippership of Milton Garby, the Tivoli boys had a crushing defeat on Taylors. So I found this really interesting. And then moving on to the next one. Uh, so, in this workman report published on July 5, 1919, it states that the standard uh, for whom Milton Garvey was playing defeats uh, the another team called BGCC. And here in this match, Milton Garvey actually scored 13 and his team won. And, oh, sorry. So, and he kept playing for different matches. And especially I want to mention uh, the October 19 one, this particular one, which uh, very notably, it was uh, Milton Garvey's performance was celebrated in this particular uh, newspaper report. And it says that uh, here, Milton Garvey and another uh, player Thompson was, uh, the, uh, sorry, standard did best and we are the responsible parties of the Joker's defeat. So he was being credited for his, <clears throat> Uh, participation in the and his performance for the match. Uh, Garvey also participated in the West Indian Carnival matches. So in this particular report um, that was published on January 24, 92, uh, registers uh, Milton Garvey's participation in the team, uh, Mr. Holder's X. Uh, so there was these two teams that played once again and Mr. Holder's 11 and Mr. Kane's 11. And uh, Milton Garvey actually played for Mr. Kane's 11. Here we get from this one. So, oops, sorry. So here, this one, it mentions Milton Garvey's uh, playing uh, participation. Okay. I think this, uh, this is a good vantage point to move on to the next uh, point that is, uh, 
West Indian uh, cultural practices, uh, that is carnival. Uh, this section highlight, uh, so Milton Garby's participation in the carnival matches calls attention to the socio-cultural practices of the West Indian communities in Panama. West Indians transform Panamanian culture and space by importing West Indian cultural practices, in this case, carnival celebration. So the workmen actually reported many incidents of that and how they uh, contributed to the development of the West Indian culture in Panama. So West Indians hosted several events in Panama's carnival. Uh, for example, the Silver City Band performance, the carnival dance at the clubhouse, grand variety ent entertainment and so on. And for a particular year in 1920, um, so here it's actually a beautiful float representing an old Spanish galleon was designed and constructed by the West Indian Carnival Committee. So now I would like to walk you uh, through the uh, gallery, photo gallery. Okay, so this one, um, as you can see, uh, there is a band uh, marching on the street on Cologne. Uh, of Cologne 19, in 1948. So this is the picture that we have. And then here, this, this is the carnival float going on here. So, and then moving on to the, the very enthusiastic crowd uh, moving across the uh, uh, street uh, of Panama. And this one is uh, Porto Velo. So I would show this one gathering. And then uh, there is this band uh, on the streets of Colon. And here is there is this canal zone uh, float going on. So celebrating the uh, festival. So I think that's all from me. And uh, thank you very much. And now I would love to request my colleague Brooke to, uh, to continue with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Danala. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce possibly our longest section of this exhibit, which is the focus on Milton Garvey's playwriting. So we've titled this section um, using a quote from The Workman, which calls Milton Garvey a genuinely black playwright. I have an example of his signature right, right here. So Garvey had an important presence in the West Indian Panamanian sphere as a cricket star, but it was his theatrical career that actually launched him into the spotlight of the national public. Working alongside the Panama Melodramatic Association, he staged his first production, which we'll discuss in a bit, Rambling Rose, in August of 1924. In the very Dadaist theater of Panama City, in front of an audience of hundreds, Garvey began to cement himself as a pro prominent and prolific Isthmian director, writer, and producer. So I have sort of a, a map here to kind of draw together disparate geographical elements. So I wanna emphasize that Rambling Rose set a few precedents for Garvey's work. Despite its initial staging in Panama City, the show explored life in the theatrical world of New York City with all the pleasures and perils such a life entailed. Garvey's subsequent shows all followed suit. All of Garvey's known works take place in New York. With his work in the theater, Garvey is contributing to both the canon of the Panama Renaissance and the Harlem Renaissance, as my colleague Ch uh, Chandler discussed before. Despite the distance between the two locations, they were writing at each other and with each other. Um, Garvey was also a known correspondent with several prominent Black New York playwrights as well, and they frequently worked together. As you'll also see throughout this section of our exhibit, the female performers, musicians, and writers in Garvey's shows presented a type of counter image to the typical archival portrayal of West Indian women. And to wrap up this introduction, even though we don't have any of Garvey's scripts, which are unfortunately, as far as we know, lost to time, a great deal of information can still be gleaned from the preservations of the West Indian press and of family members like Nidia. Almost all the research in this section of this, of this exhibit comes from articles within the workmen in particular, which you'll see as we scroll throughout this exhibit. So I'll turn now over to Chandler. Thank you, Brooke. So 
So I have the honor of introducing our first play, which is Rambling Rose. And this is Milton Garvey's first stage production. So Rambling Rose was first staged at the Veridades Theater in August, 1924. And you can see this is an advertisement of Rambling Rose. Keep scrolling. Rambling Rose was an absolute success from the start. It portrays and depicts the cabaret girls of Broadway and the gossip and scandal that follows its leading lady, Rose. So we have several newspaper clippings from the workmen. This first one kind of gives a teaser for Rambling Rose. It sets up the advertisement. So one thing that you'll notice throughout this exhibit is that Milton Garvey's plays were heavily covered in the West Indian press, particularly the workmen. And I think that's so fascinating to see the media coverage that uh, Garvey's plays garnered. So this is just a brief synopsis of Rambling Rose, but it essentially depicts the character Rose Snow and her travelings away from her home, which is um, the imaginary Woodville, and then her adventures in New York, where she ultimately comes back home and reconciles with her love, Victor. So as Brooke was saying, the majority of Garvey's plays take place in the setting of New York City and depicts all the themes of scandal, romance, tragedy, and sensation. But Rambling Rose was an extreme hit after the first showing at the Veridades Theater. Um, Garvey and his plays gained the admiration and support of several Panamanian literary societies. And these societies were really important to this culture. We have this great quote from the workman that says, the literary society here is a wonderful medium by which the members of the community may not only improve themselves intellectually, but by its varied educational program, help to raise the standard of the community to a higher level, which will ultimately help us keep pace with reasonable progress. So as the journalist noted, the West Indian community valued literature. West Indian's literature uplifted the community, demonstrated its modernity, and also transformed Panamanian national culture, which is what Rambling Rose helped contribute to. One particular moment that I want to highlight in Rambling Rose is again how popular it was. It was specifically requested to be performed at the Paradiso Clubhouse. So residents of Paradiso called on the secretary of the clubhouse to stage the play. And this showing was dubbed a historical event by the workmen due to the anticipated crowd. We have this map here that helps you, let's see if I can, yeah, there we go. We have this map here that helps you kind of get a better understanding of how far individuals were traveling. So here is the Pariso Clubhouse and we have all of these routes that individuals were traveling. The workman quotes the event as pulling in individuals from across the canal. So the Rambling Rose really solidified itself as a success for Garvey. Rambling Rose provided audiences with a compelling production, and it also reflected the cultivation of transnational Black culture by West Indians, musicians, and performers in Panama. Its protagonist, Rose, re resembles the many actors and musicians who migrated to the United States. One thing that we really wanted to work on in this project is showing the different roles that performers played um, in this community. And part of it is a reflection that we do see West Indians as performers, as musicians, as actors and actresses, which is something that we've noted is heavily absent from the archive. We also wanted to talk about Garvey's role in employing women. So Garvey plays often featured women in leading roles and performances and showcases the employment of women as leading performers. Ree Vickett, v. Ricketts, who you can see right here, played Rose. Ellen Joshua also played a cabaret member. This image over here portrays Lydia Holder, who was the leading pianist in Panama. She was the lead pianist for Rambling Rose and also would uh, play the piano for several of Garvey's other productions. The prominence of women as leading performers challenges the misconception and stereotype that West Indian women only worked as domestic labor. Milton Garvey's success with Rambling Rose would serve as a launch point for his theatrical career. His second production, The Prince of Wall Street, would prove to be his most renowned. And now I'll have the opportunity to talk about The Prince of Wall Street, which is arguably his most famous production. This is, the map. this is a map of locations where the Prince of Wall Street was performed. So again, as you can see, these are multiple locations expanding a wide geographical space, also contributing to the success of the Prince of Wall Street. 
So the first mention of the play is in the March 28th, 1925th edition of The Workman. And we have several news clippings here that kind of overview that uh, preview. Later on the June 13th, 1925 edition, the play would be promoted as taking place at the Veridades Theater, which was on the Pacific side of Panama on June 22nd. So a little bit about the synopsis. The Prince of Wall Street portrays the life of Wilbur Emerson, a son of a millionaire in New York City, again emphasizing that many of Garvey's plays took place in New York, who begins investing in the stock market. The four-act melodrama follows his downfall as greed leads him to lose his wealth, leading him to an unhappy marriage and an extramarital affair. Wilbur is ultimately betrayed by his mistress and is later accused of murder. Here we have some more advertisement and some newspapers that again hail the Prince of Wall Street as a success. You can click through these. And again, you can interact with those. Though originally only set to play for two nights, the Prince of Wall Street proved to be widely popular with Americans, West Indians, and Panamanians. Due to high demand, the play would later be played on the Atlantic side of the Panama of the Panama at the Paraviso Clubhouse on July 14th and at the Strand Theater on August 18th. The play was also staged at the National Theater in 1933, again emphasizing how often this play was, request, was requested to be performed. The Prince of Wall Street was successful and significant to the West Indian population in Panama. One reviewer writes that no other play, local or foreign, has made such sweeping successes here. Early articles of the play applauded the ability of an amateur trope to act as professionals, again, emphasizing Garvey's employment of West Indians as performers and musicians. Other reviewers positioned Garvey's work as developing a race consciousness of West Indians. Garvey was in tune with the needs of the public and wrote plays that West Indians would want to attend. In an article written after your initial staging, one reviewer notes that, quote, Milton knows what his people want, and he gave it to them with the Prince of Wall Street. Garvey also spotlighted amateur West Indian performers and tied their talents to a larger theatrical culture and aesthetic. One that we're going to talk about in particular is Irish George, who you can see in the newspapers, in the newspaper clippings here. Many of the performers in Garvey's play would go on to become staples in Panamanian theatrical circles. One example is again, Irish George, who played Nellie in The Prince of Wall Street. In her initial performance as Nellie Taylor, a cabaret singer who became the wife of Wilbur, Irish George became so popular that she quote, endeared herself to the entire Ismian community. So again, we have an emphasis that Milton Garvey is employing women in these productions as performers. Garvey's productions reflect one way Afro-Caribbean migrants and West Indians created networks of resistance through cultural movements such as jazz, dance, performance, and theater in order to build roots of Black internationalism. But Garvey's theatrical career wouldn't end with The Prince of Wall Street. And now I'll pass it to my colleague, Sasha, who will discuss Helen the Showgirl. Thank you, Chandler. So I have the pleasure of discussing Helen the Showgirl. Helen the Showgirl was Garvey's third stage play and one of his more famous productions. It came out at the end of 1926. And here is a photo of the cast. As you can see, women were front and center in Garvey's plays and Helen the Showgirl is no different. So, oh, come on. Helen the Showgirl depicts the Broadway shows of New York City and the drama of trying to make it successful in such. Helen the Showgirl's original run was so successful that it came back the following year in 1927. However, it is generally concluded that The Prince of Wall Street is Garvey's most famous play. So a short synopsis of Helen the Showgirl. Helen the Showgirl was a was a four part play and it depicts Helen, a poor country girl who travels to New York City to be on Broadway. During her time on Broadway, she is lavished with attention by a multimillionaire theater manager who wants to become more intimate. A shocking discovery is made at the end of the second act that Helen is actually the manager's daughter. The rest of the play is unknown to us, but this allows us a glimpse into the literary genius of Garvey. As seen in this newspaper clipping here, um, the crowds could not stay away and the first two nights were standing room only for Helen the showgirl. A newspaper reporter says, 
I wasn't able to secure a seat, the only ones available being on the knees of the ladies in advert of poise or weight if nothing else was against me. So WCK, um, the reporter quoted above, had some critiques about the play, such as the paternity reveal in the middle and not at the end, citing that if the revelation had been at the end, it would have brought out a wonderful moral in the play and put it on equal terms with the Prince of Wall Street. Praises were put on all the performers as seen in this news clipping, especially the main actress, Cicely Cumberland, who looked at home on stage, bringing out the difficult role. The other members of the troupe were well-known actors and actresses in the Panama theater community. WCK says the general acting of the troupe was highly commendable, while it is not out of place to especially mention that of the Craigwell girls, the Codlin brothers, Miss Etta Chambers, and Mr. Fred Braithwaite. As you can see here, here are some photos of the main performers, Miss Cicely Cumberland, Fred Braithwaite, and Miss Etta Chambers. Fred, Bra sorry, Fred Braithwaite also um, composed all the musical scores in the play alongside Garfield Murray, the director of the Panama Symphony Orchestra. Plays such as Helen the Showgirl, Rambling Rose, and The Prince of Wall Street show that the politics of respectability of a woman of women occurred on and off stage. West Indian women were representatives of their community and the importance of appearing proper cannot be understated. Besides all three, all three plays being set in New York City and having amazing plots, play reviews such as the one seen below show that women acting in plays and attending plays were often discussed. WCK, while writing about Helen the Showgirl in another play, laments on how women have decided to show more skin by wearing lower necklines and shorter skirts. Plays were platforms to critique the actors' and actresses' performances, and they also became a place of judgment for actresses and the female audiences' bodies and respectability, which represented the communities that they were from. I'll now be passing it on to Brooke. <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. So I will be concluding our exhibit by discussing Garvey's legacy. So as we stated in the introduction, this exhibit sought to highlight and expand upon the research West Indian Panamanian descendants, such as Nydia Thomas, have conducted to preserve their family lineage. Milton Garvey, for us, served as a focal point for the nuanced and varied experiences of West Indians living and working in Panama. Garvey was a notable figure not only in the West Indian community, but also throughout Panama as his theatrical efforts served to establish himself. In fact, much of Garvey's legacy survives to this day because his family kept his life alive through storytelling, scrapbooking, and archival research. His descendants are actually now spread far across the borders of Panama. I have a map here. Um, not only do some live in Costa Rica, Panama, but also across the United States and in France as well. Even now, many of Garvey's relatives still pursue work in and around the theater, contributing to this cultural renaissance that Garvey himself fostered. I would like to take a second to highlight some of these individuals. We have Will Pryor, who works as an independent recording artist based in Atlanta. Ashley M. Thomas, who works as documentary film production manager in New York. Fur Fernando Garvey, who's an artist, illustrator, and musician in Panama. John Patrick Barber, who's a professional trombonist and an educator in Texas. Carlos Real Garvey, who's the co-founder of Dance Unity in Panama. Eloisa Garvey Brown, who's a former soprano for El Coro Polificano de Panama in Georgia. William N. Thomas III, who is a retired university theater production coordinator in Texas. And Aline de Casa Real, who's a professional dancer in Panama. In all, um, Garvey's life shows the ways in which West Indians contributed not only to the construction of the Panama Canal, but also to this construction of a 20th century Black diasporic modernity. Garvey's plays were notable not only in Panamanian culture, but also abroad as they served as representations of the international nature of Black culture in the period of the Harlem Renaissance. Also, it's important to note that Milton Garvey's sons, Clifford and Cecile, actually performed in Garvey's last stage show. Mm -hmm. We have an article clipping here. 
Garvey's plays may have been physically lost, but his work was preserved both by his family members and the efforts of the West Indian press. Ideally, this archive will now be counted as another contribution towards these preservation efforts. And now it would be my honor and pleasure to finish this project with a poem by Garvey's son, Clifford Garvey. This was published and as part of Milton Garvey's obituary. Tis curtain time and death takes Milton Garvey in another role. His greatest audience waits as seconds hurry on. No one applauds, there's a hush, a silence deep as death itself. He pauses at a lonely stage door, grimly marked the world beyond. No glaring foot or spotlight plays upon his pale cold face. No blazing rhythm nor prelude soft and low. No make-believe of tears or smiles through mere pretext. When death's grim reaper told my father, one minute to go, you're next. So one by one, they go away as the years roll hurriedly on. Each one in turn makes their exit to a stage in the world beyond. So let's live to leave our footprints. Tomorrow, it may be the cold sod. No one can tell who may be next to make their bow to God. Thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Shayantika for our final acknowledgements. Thank you, Brooke. So I have the daunting task of doing the acknowledgements because due to the time constraints, I will not be able to mention each and every one who has helped us uh, in this project. So I'd request you to take a look at the list of everyone um, that we have listed here at your own convenience. And my apologies in advance for that because I'm not able to take everyone's name. So I'd like to begin with obviously the Digital uh, Library of the Caribbean, the Pan-Caribbean Sankofa, the Panama Museum Collection, and our very own George S. Mathers Libraries or the Library East, and obviously our two amazing librarians, Sean and Betsy, who have always been very patient with all our queries and questions and have been very prompt in their replies. So we are really, really grateful to you for that. And obviously this project wouldn't have been possible without you, Nidia Thomas, and your family and your generous help at each step uh, during this project. So a special mention to Nidia Thomas and um, her family, and obviously um, a few of our family members, Carmen, Fran, who is here with us, and also Cosmo. Um, and last but not the least, we are also very grateful to our story map team especially our advisor, Dr. Leah Rosenberg, who has been helping us throughout the project. And I also thank my wonderful colleagues here. And obviously, lastly, I thank all of you who are present here today to listen to our presentation and to encourage us. And we really, really look forward to any possible future collaboration like this. And if you have any suggestion, advice, insight for us, because we are still learning, Please, please enrich us and enlighten us with all that. Thank you so much. I end the presentation on everyone's behalf. Well, thanks. That was a great job. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful project, a great experience. We've enjoyed working with you. We have plenty of time for questions and comments, and I'm sure you have some for the group. So I just wanted to uh, open the floor for questions. I'm actually going to walk around with a microphone, and that way, for those uh, people who are uh, online, they can hear your questions. So if you'll raise your hand, I'll bring you a microphone, and you can ask a, con ask a question or make a comment. Well, we got one on Morning, I'm Sheila Clark Wilkinson from Panama. I came from Panama for this event. I'm very grateful that somebody encouraged me to come. I won't call the person's name. I wanna congratulate you young people. You have done a wonderful job. You have opened my eyes to so many things. I have a lot of different uh, ideas I can give you. Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing what I'm seeing. There is so much. Thank you, Nidia. 
Thank you so much. It is uh, amazing what a family preserved. I've been, I deal a lot with Barbados and I've been to some of these uh, diaspora conferences. And there is a lady that lives in Connecticut, a Barbadian. Her name is Sandra Tate Eady. And she talks about, you know, we have our grandparents that they tell you, oh, you know, that person did this and he did this. And we take things for granted. We need to listen. We need to listen and record things that the old people say. Even we are the old people now. I am part of the old people now because I'm 76 years old. And uh, we have to try to preserve. It's amazing. I know about the Tivoli Guest House. I live some of these things here. And uh, it's, you know, the black person was invisible, invisible. Her grandfather, Milton Garvey, was invisible, but you guys have brought him to life. And uh, there is so much, so much that I have been learning just today. I'm somebody that knows a whole lot of people, a whole lot of people. And I am going to be somebody instrumental in trying to help as much as I can. I'm going to give you guys my card. I live in Panama, but I have a lot of telephones. I have a US line and I have, you know, WhatsApp and all that. You young people can feel proud, hug yourselves, pat yourselves on your back. Nidia, you have opened. I don't know if it's a box of worms or snakes or what, but I wanna say thank you. Thank you for you, the team, for Nidia and her family members that are here. This is a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. Thank you. Thank you. I am Carl Coburn, and um, actually, I'm Sheila Wilkinson, um, and I we we were we grew up at the same church. Yeah, that's right. Um, thank you very much um, for bringing uh, Milton Garvey to life for me. Um, we speak about invisibility, but it wasn't only invisible to um, the white Zonians. He was invisible to me. I've never heard of, of that part of my culture. Um, and I, I think it has a lot to do with the, the geographical um, separation of people on, on the Atlantic side of the country and the people on the Pacific side of the country that we don't talk about very much. But I, I thought that we grew up in a pretty culturally aware family. And our teachers um, on the Atlantic side of the country certainly were very proud of the um, West Indian culture in Panama. And this never came up. I never heard of, you know, um, a playwright, um, a West Indian playwright in, in Panama, I mean, until, until now. So I, I really appreciate um, your bringing to life um, a part of my culture that I was not aware of and that um, I would have been telling my grandkids about it, you know, because their father who is um, a Native American, if you want to put it that way, so is my, so is my daughter, but you know, I don't, she, she probably doesn't feel that way because I keep reminding her of her, um, of her Panamanian West Indian side. Um, but um, I keep trying to tell them about my culture and this is something that they would have uh, that they would appreciate because I have two grandsons, fourteen years old, that played cricket in school. Thanks, but not thanks to the um, to the presence of Pakistanis and Indians in the United States, not necessarily of um, Jamaicans or people from the Caribbean. So, um, yeah, this is something else I can um, I can impart to them um, and kind of overload them on my culture because they need it. So thank you very much. And I lived in, in East Texas. It must be kind of quite interesting. I'm, 
I, I, I lived there only like three years and it was enough for me. So, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Hello. I am so grateful to be here today. I just want to give all of you a big thank you for letting me know a lot more of my father. It is such an honor to come here and listen to the things that you all have said about him that I did not know. I knew some, but some of those things that you all, it's, it's, I can't even explain how I feel right now. It's so emotional to me. And I just want to thank you that you did this work on behalf of my niece, Nidia, and you talk so eloquently of my father. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm so emotional, so I am done. I am done. I can't take it. It's really something great to know that in my lifetime, my father was very, very known and was very good. I am so proud of you for doing that for me. Thank you very much. I don't know if I can stand or I should sit to talk about my grandfather. I had the privilege to live with Milton Garvey. Milton Garvey, all the things you guys showed and talk about him just took me back. Took me back to the man that I knew the man that I saw reading Shakespeare back in those days, the man that I saw taking notes and making scratches and sitting in a, just in his room quietly, just looking up and writing down stuff. I was only seven, eight, nine years. I really didn't know that this that we have today for this generation, because I'm old too, as a lady say, <laughs> is something so emotional for me. But I know for you guys, it's going to be like a bright star that it will be shining. And you're walking down a good path right now. And there is more to learn. There's more to see. There are more Milton Garvey that you haven't discovered yet. But I am sure that there are other Milton Garvey. And I am a Garvey. And I can remember looking around on my family, say, hmm, these people like to dance. These people like to sing. These I, I, yes, I know why now. I've acted in a lot of plays in church and thing, and, and sometimes I go and hide from the people that are doing the production. I say, Eloisa, you have a part to play. I say, oh no, my grandfather is here again. But there's no word to say what you guys have done. And it's, we're not gonna stop right here. We're gonna continue. And maybe I can help with something, I don't know. But I'm here to help. And I open my heart to everyone that took the time to come here, to listen, to learn, and to walk forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bernadette, and um, I am amazed at what we saw here today. I just want to take a moment to thank Fran, Frances Yearwood is, look at what you did. She is so inquisitive. I mean, so busy. 
I, I mean, she wouldn't let, <laughs> she would not let anything or any conversation just stay at that. She just digs and digs and digs and go further and further and further till something comes out of nothing. And um, I, I just want to thank her and let her know that um, all that she does is really appreciated, even though we probably don't say it every day, but it really is. You are the one person in our community that um, we can count on to take up the torch and run with it. And um, sometimes we don't even ask and she's gone with it. <laughs> but I would appreciate and I think I'd like a lot more of us to ask and for her to learn to delegate. And um, with that, we would reach a lot wider and deeper audience uh, in our community. And um, I, I just want to say thank you, friend, really. Ooh. <laughs> Um, I can honestly say that from the time I sat down and friends started to talk, I had to take out a tissue because I've been dabbing my eyes the whole time. But I just simply wanted to say that in her closing remarks, she invited us to continue to enrich and enlighten them. And you have enriched and enlightened me and all of us just in such an amazing way. And I just really wanted to say thank you. And I look forward to the rest of this event. All right, two more questions over here. She beat you to it, Nitty. I'm gonna hand it back. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Luisa and I am from Panama. And I, I was scrolling through my email and then I found this thing from UF. My daughter is, um, I'm, my daughter is, went to UF. And, and so I get emails from UF for some reason. And I was scrolling through there and I saw this email and I opened it. And this week is my birthday. Oh my so I told my husband over here that um, this is what I want to do for my birthday. I did oh. not know. <laughs> I did not know that this was going to be such a wonderful, wonderful presentation of someone from our past. And so my husband said, well, let's go with someone. So I called my girlfriend over <laughs> Dida and I said, listen, this is happening in, in, in Gainesville, let's go. And she said, yes, let's go. <laughs> and, and so we're here, we're from Tallahassee and you are from Palm Coast. Palm, Palm Coast. But, but um, what I wanna say is that it did open a Pandora's box because um, th there is a movement in Panama. There has been a movement. I've been part of a movement um, from the 60s. And there is a movement now in Panama about just Afro descendants and culture and, you know, Ethnia Negra and, you know, a whole lot of stuff happening, bringing our culture and our way of life to life in Panama. It's been a struggle. There is still that racism going on and happening. So it's been a struggle, but it's coming to life now and I can see it. I want to just mention two people, Carlos Rosso. Yes. He is dead now, but he has done tremendous work about the, um, the whole um, playwriting, you know, culture. And then there is someone that is alive right now. His name is Gerardo Maloney. And he just received an award in Panama for a playwright. And so that Pandora's box, I don't live in Panama, but I could hand it over to her where you probably would be able to get in touch with them because they 
they kind of like followed, uh, they must know him because they followed in Milton Garvey's footstep mm -hmm. about, you know, how to bring our culture and our way of life to the mainstream life, especially Panama. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for, thank you for doing this program. And I am so happy that we're here. And I just want to reiterate that Fran is an example of a person who says, be the change that you want to see in the world. And we need people like that who will take a, an, a concept and an idea and move forward with it. So thank you for taking this to the next level. The next person that I would like to thank actually is Mr. Roman Foster, because in 19, I think it was 85, I was a student in Washington, DC, and I watched your documentary and just realized that there were so many stories out there that needed to be told. And looking at the elder gentleman and saying, we're missing out on that oral history. And so I found it amazing that your seed money or some of it came from Alex Haley, who, who sparked my love of genealogy in 1978. So it's, there's a chain happening. And again, being the change that we want to see and having people who are receptive to listening like the University of Florida, who are taking that to the next level and to these amazing students who took it to the next level and Dr. Rosenberg and, and, and just really doing the kind of work because I love the way that you fell in love with my grandfather, a man who was born more than a hundred years ago, but he became real to you. And so I thank you for your scholarship and your work because you now are responsible for telling his story. Can I quickly say something? Um, Milton Garvey's legacy, um, so his legacy, it doesn't end here because we are going to do a conference presentation on Milton Garvey's literary output um, at a conference soon happening in October at the University of Bahamas. So obviously we are not stopping here. So we are expanding our horizon and we need all your blessings for that. And we might just bother you with our questions via emails. So expect that from us for sure. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you again. It was an amazing project, amazing presentation. I also wanted to add that uh, Leah Rosenberg is, when we had that first meeting here and we invited Fran and the other directors of CGM, Leah was one of the first people on our list of who we should include because she's long been teaching classes. She's long been doing research in, in the Caribbean. And this class is yet another example of this great relationship that uh, we have with uh, the resources that we have here in the library, the teaching that goes on on campus and research, particularly in this case with graduate students. So I'm hoping this is the beginning of a lot of good things to come and we'll have more of this in the future. Um, we are out of time now for our first session. I know there's probably more comments, but uh, hopefully you'll have time to see everybody and talk to each other uh, over lunch. I uh, hope you guys are staying for lunch. Oh, did you want to say one more thing? Just yeah. one word. I just wanted yeah. to thank Pan Caribbean Sankofa and the George Smathers Libraries. It's just amazing the support and the opportunity that they've given to, to me and to, to our students. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. All right, uh, for those of you who are online, we are going to be pausing for a lunch break now, and we are going to be resuming at uh, 2.30 uh, this afternoon. So please sign back in on in Zoom or YouTube, however you're joining us at 2.30. Uh, and uh, I will go ahead and stop sharing this now. Oh,